we are live at this point. It says that we are now streaming on uh, Facebook Live, and we've got a couple of attendees that have made their way into the webinar. Sorry to interrupt, um, uh, Martha and Brennan, who were talking about uh, online instruction for yes, the fall. Really. And these, isn't the, everybody's favorite word, unprecedented? Um, <laughs> these unprecedented times. This is an unprecedented evening. It's a Wednesday. Yeah. And we are here for office hours. Um, I don't know. I don't know how much I like it, uh, but yeah, <laughs> un unprecedented right now at this moment. But yeah, but I but I, I use it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Well, thank so, you everybody for for coming here for joining us. Uh, this is uh, office hours. Uh, my name is Brennan Breed. Uh, I am uh, an Old Testament professor at the Columbia Theological Seminary, just up the street from where I am now in Decatur, uh, and. Uh, who, who are you, person next to me, on my, at least on my screen, my, my left? Yeah, I, I hope that's me. Uh, my name yes. is Chris, and I am the Scholar in Residence and Director of Biblical and Theological Education at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. And for week three in our study of the book of James, we are joined uh, by Dr. Martha Morkish, who I think we can both say is a friend of ours. Um, yes. You guys are so. colleagues at Columbia Theological Seminary. And uh, Martha and I have done some work together in the past in a variety of settings. So um, we are very grateful to have um, uh, Dr. Morkish on, a, on our uh, conversation tonight. And it's unique um, because she is the first theologian that we've had as a part of our discussion. The first systematic theologian. Oh my God. I, I don't know. I feel like I might have underdressed. What do you think, Brennan? No, I, <laughs> we, we, we also have to say one other thing is that she is the only systematic theologian we've had on. Uh, also, she's the only person to have published on James that we've had on, I think. <laughs> so, so go, go with that where you want to go. But, uh, but maybe the biblical scholars are dropping the ball a bit and the theologians are picking it up. Um, uh, but either way, uh, Martha Morkish uh, has uh, just published a commentary on the book of James. Uh, so we are looking forward to learning from her wisdom, and we will talk about wisdom, in fact, today. Uh, there it is, indeed. Uh, we have mentioned it many times uh, on Office Hours, but we strongly encourage it um, uh, for everyone. But we'll be able to hear uh, uh, from Martha herself about her work. Uh, so, uh, Martha, we usually start Office Hours by asking a pretty general question, but something that kind of lets us uh, get a sense for, for who you are and what you um, bring to your reading of the text. And that, that question is, um, what what are one or two uh, kind of hermeneutical principles or interpretive principles, some assumptions that you bring with you to the reading of the text that you might want to share with us today? Um, uh, the, you know, things that kind of inform who you are and, and what you make of texts. Yeah, thanks. And thanks really to both of you, Chris and Brennan, for inviting me here. Um, this is a, it's a little bit of a, um, I come with some trepidation, right, coming to speak to two biblical scholars about a biblical text, but but here we are. So you do know more than us about it. So <laughs> <laughs> you keep saying that. We'll see. Um, but when it comes to hermeneutical uh, presuppositions, um, when it comes to scripture in general, um, I come uh, as a self-identified practicing uh, reformed theologian, um, which means both of the things I'm going to say uh, come broadly speaking from uh, kind of reformed theological that world. Um, one of them is uh, that it tends more toward coherence and one towards tends more toward diversity. So let me say that overall. First of all, um, I do carry a conviction that there is some kind of coherence to scripture, broadly speaking, as a whole. And that coherence has to do with the conviction that scripture witnesses to God's activity over time um, with uh, the covenant people, and most clearly then in the person of Jesus Christ. So a sense of coherence in covenant history and um, most clearly in uh, Christ, those who know the name of Karl Barth might um, sense here that I have a, a little bit of a Barthian um, bent, at least insofar as I, I do have a, um, the sense that when we need a norm to help us to interpret scripture, uh, Christ is, for me, still the clearest norm for trying to adjudicate um, how to read a text. That is to say, uh, in Christ we see uh, God's um, love uh, for the world most clearly embodied 
and uh, therefore um, that enables us to read other texts that might not express that quite so clearly. So there's a kind of coherence there and a kind of Christological um, center. At the same time, uh, I also believe that scripture is a place where uh, God speaks by the power of the spirit in a way that is living and that changes over time and that speaks differently to different communities over time. And so alongside of that uh, kind of coherence uh, and that Christological center, I also carry um, a, a hermeneutical presupposition that scripture is not gonna speak the same way, God is not gonna speak the same way to everyone in every place and every time through, the, through uh, scripture. So, so there is um, the Holy Spirit is at work um, in surprising ways. And it means therefore, for example, in reading James became really important for me to, um, to listen to the voices of interpreters of James who are from different communities. Um, people like Margaret Amer, who is reading James from a diaspora lens through the lens of migration or Elsa Thomas, who is reading James particularly through a Latin American liberation lens. Um, right, so I think it's really important as an interpreter to engage um, a variety of uh, other audiences and other readers um, when I'm reading scripture too. Great, that's that's awesome, and I I think even the the diversity in some ways for those that watched last week picks up on our some of our discussion about how Paul and James pick up on the tradition of Abraham in a bit of a different way, and and yes. if there was only one meaning to the story of Abraham, we would have to say, well, is it James or is it Paul? But since there is this diversity or plurality of meanings and the ways in which people can make meaning out of the text, we can say, oh, they're both right. They, you know, they're, they're doing different things with this yeah. story. Um, yeah, so yeah. Um, I love that. So we want to talk just briefly about your recent work on James, uh, which I've already shown. And We've for those of you that haven't checked uh, for those of you that haven't checked it out yet, um, and you need a reason to, in uh, in Martha's discussion of James chapter three, she mentions the movie Mean Girls, the Broadway musical Hamilton, and the the cult classic Lord of the Rings, all in a discussion of James chapter three. So if there's no other reason than because she talks at at two pages about Hamilton then, you know, you just, you need to go get it. So what was it like, you, um, what was it like for you as a theologian um, writing about a New Testament text, in particular, a New Testament text like the book of James? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, the, the first thing it felt like uh, was really daunting, right? The first thing was I was deeply aware of um, entering into a discourse that was not not my native land, if you will. I mean, yes, I read the Bible, right? But as a theologian, I don't typically um, spend my time focused on a particular text resting with just that text for an extended period of time, right? So as a, as a theologian, I typically would begin with something like um, either a situational question or a, a broad category question, right? How do we interpret um, uh, Jesus's death, for example, as salvific, right? That's a typical uh, theological question, mm -hmm. conceptual question. And then I go and look for resources to try to think about that. Um, and uh, to do this work was uh, in a way, at the beginning, at least, it felt really uh, almost the opposite of what I usually do, right? So just to say th the task was, here's a book and interpret this book for today. Uh, and uh, it felt like a really, really long sermon or lots and lots and lots of little sermons, right? <laughs> um, which was actually, after I sort of adjusted my mind, it, it became really exciting and refreshing. And I learned so much about um, this curious little, what I've come to call a kind of minority report in the New Testament, um, unlike, uh, in many ways, unlike any other book. Uh, in the New Testament, um, and to discover this kind of renaissance of interpretation that's really um, emerged in the past 20 years or so in James studies, led by people like Luke Timothy Johnson, Chris's prof uh, professor, um, uh, who has really forged some new ground in interpretation of James, um, challenging some former in interpretations. And it, so it, it led me to, to see how 
things like uh, what might seem like arcane debates about genre and dating actually have really important theological implications. Mm. Uh, these, these are not insignificant questions. Um, so that's, that was important to me to, to kind of begin to get a glimpse of what I, I've become convinced is uh, likely emerging from the, an early first century kind of Jewish Christian community at a time when there really is no hard boundary between Jews and Christians, when all Christians were simply were Jews, right? Jesus followers were Torah followers. There was no, te- there's no evident tension in, uh, in James between those two communities. And, uh, and therefore, some scholars think this might actually be a glimpse into what later patristic authors call the Ebionites, this mysterious um, group that gets referenced and condemned um, a couple of centuries later. But, um, but I've, I've begun now when I think about uh, those early Christological controversies, I now think about James and I think, oh, this might have been part of what was going on and I'm not going to be so quick now to condemn the Ebionites uh, because I have an idea about where they might be coming from. Yeah, yeah. That's that's awesome. And so one of the one of the places we left off last week with Dr. Matt, Matt Skinner was how how James, because of its emphasis on on practice and right behavior, sort of challenges some notions of systematic theology as sort of just being about thinking and saying the right things. Um, yeah. And so um, as a as a systematic theologian, how do you how do you think you know at the end of this project? How does James mm-hmm. speak to the discipline of of theology or to the discipline of systematic theology? Yeah, yeah, I, it's a great question. Um, so I like very much what uh, what Matt said last week about that, and I think for sure that right for sure if if systematic theology means something that has nothing to do with actual lived embodied ethical behavior, then James is not for that. Uh, uh, and neither am I, really. Uh, so whatever I do as a theologian, I hope I don't do that. Um, but, uh, but he does, therefore, offer a caution to that, right? Um, and he offers another kind of caution, too. And um, reading James also, um, precisely because his voice is, I, I allude to James, right, in quotation marks here, acknowledging we don't actually know who that is. But the writer, wh- whatever, the person we call James, um, uh, is so distinctive um, in, the, in the New Testament canon that, um, that spending time with James also offers a caution against any kind of systematic theology that would mask diversity of voices mm-hmm. in the canon, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, I mean, you alluded earlier to the, what, what some have seen as a strong tension between um, James and Paul. Um, Luther certainly saw that as a tension, maybe, maybe not. But in any case, they are, they're different. They're certainly different, uh, addressing different communities, different concerns. So, so in one way, um, reading James uh, helps me as a systematic theologian to be careful about masking any diversity. But in another way, and this is something that I really came to deeply appreciate about James, and I'll be interested to know what you all think about this, um, but it, it seems to me that one of the things James is doing throughout the book is just being a really creative and attentive reader of scripture for his time. Um, he, and, and you don't realize this um, at first because he doesn't footnote what he's doing. Um, at least, right, we, we, don't, we don't see the footnotes. Uh, but he is drawing on the whole scope of uh, the Torah, particularly Leviticus 19, repeatedly shows up. Um, the prophets, I mean, he echoes not so much in James 3, but certainly in 4 and 5, echoes of Amos and Micah. And then um, also, as you know, Brennan has pointed out already, uh, the wisdom literature, yeah. Proverbs, Ben Sira. And, and in a really evocative way, um, James shows me as a systematic theologian what it looks like to broadly embody, imbibe, internalize, and in, interpret the whole breadth of um, what was for him 
write scripture for his time, for that mm. situation. That's an interesting kind of model for a systematic theologian, I think, yeah. that I can, uh, that I can uh, learn from. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's great because I think a lot, part, you know, you guys teach a lot of seminarians and, and there's almost a fear that if preaching is anything more than repetition, it's somehow inauthentic or it's, or it's mm. dangerous. And you look at somebody like James who is, is doing more than simply quoting scripture. He's using scripture. He's mm -hmm. making sense out of scripture. He's making sense out of his reality using scripture, um, which is at the end of the day, what all great preaching is, is yeah. it's more than just getting up and reading scripture, right? It has to, it, it takes root. It takes form in our embedded and embodied community. So that's a, that's a great, that's a great perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Brennan, what do you have to say? Well, uh, well, I think we should we should think about this this text, James three, um, in terms of two different kind of units, right? Two different groups. Uh, so, chapter three, verses uh, one through twelve, we've got about speech and and talking, um, and related it seems to the idea of teaching, um, and I think it ties in really well with thirteen um, uh, through eighteen. Uh, which also is about people who are kind of in high positions, but really focuses more on the idea of wisdom. So we got speech mm -hmm. and wisdom itself, um, mm -hmm. both of which are tied together in the idea of, of wisdom. Uh, that is that uh, speech is related to uh, our, our wise use of our mouths and our minds, our hearts, our bodies, but also our interior will and uh, our desires, um, which find their way out through our speech. Uh, Freud mm -hmm. knew this well, um, as several millennia after James, um, mm -hmm. uh, the idea that the truth will find its way out, right? Uh, uh, brackish water doesn't come from, from, from clean springs, right? Um, but <clears throat> in any event, uh, but so Martha, we, th this, this text begins, the, this, this section of James begins with this um, kind of abrupt transition to teachers, the idea of teachers. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, why uh, chapter three is where it is. Um, but that idea that we shouldn't become teachers. I mean, I read this and I thought, well, <laughs> I, guess, I guess I didn't follow Ooh. James, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who am I, right? Yeah. Um, but why does James switch so quickly from righteousness and, and faith and works and the law and, you know, the, all these things, God's instruction yeah. for us, switch immediately to teachers? And yeah. what do you take from that? And why, why, is, why is teaching kind of framing this whole part of the letter? Yeah, no, that's, I, that's a really interesting question. So yeah, how, why the transition from two to three? I yeah. think that there is, there is a link uh, between where he's just been focusing on faith and works. Faith without works is dead. I think um, that, uh, that here, it's not directly, but he's also trying to say that um, that what, the way we live matters. I mean, that's really what he's after again, again, as he was in the preceding chapter, um, that, that the way you treat one another, the way you live your life is what shows what you really believe. And so I think in going after teachers or those who use words destructively, he's pointing out the way that, um, that our those who talk about faith, which goes back to chapter two, those who talk about faith could just be using so many words mm -hmm. and it might not actually bear any fruit uh, in our lives. And that's, and that's really what he's concerned about throughout, throughout chapter three. Uh, and frankly, I think that's what's going on in chapter two. So, so that's, that's the connection yeah. I see. Yeah, that's great. And what, what is that greater judgment that uh, all three of us on this yeah. screen are, uh, are tempting ourselves with? we're in for it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, James does have judgment as a through line. I yeah. mean, anybody who doesn't, who doesn't like the idea that there's going to be uh, consequences for our actions might not like James because he really does think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, does he think that that's an apocalyptic day of judgment? Some scholars think so. Um, but others, it's not so clear, but, uh, but I think regardless of whether he thinks that there's a literal apocalyptic day of judgment, uh, he does. He thinks that there are consequences, and we need to recognize the serious consequences of what we say um, and the destructive capacity. And you know, here we are in the midst of a presidential election, right? Again, uh, yeah. here we are, the week of a convention. I think Michelle Obama said something about this on Monday night. Uh, she wasn't quoting James, although her husband did recently. But uh, yeah. but she but she was echoing 
she was echoing something in her um, in her words Monday night about the power of words and the destructive mm -hmm. potential of words. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think um, James is just saying, look at what you are saying and pay attention to the power of words. Uh, the, the irony, of course, is you might think that therefore he's going to tell us, okay, just shut up, right? right. Just stop. Just, just stop. Just stop talking completely. Um, but he's not doing that. He's yeah. actually using great rhetorical skill in, yeah. uh, and Chris, you can speak to this better than I can as a Greek scholar, but, but what I understand is he is using really, imp really impressive rhetorical skill and drawing on a classical sources here. Yeah. Um, right. In so he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, he, and he's not saying shut up. He's just saying, look what I'm doing, right? Look at the way I can persuade you. Yeah. And now you pay attention to the power of these words and the way that they can be used for good or for ill. And he's profoundly aware of the way it can be used for destructive purposes. Um, and it, yeah. I mean, at, at some level, Marsh, what, what do you think about our, our ability to generalize a text like this? Because some scholars will say this has a very sort of like historical moment, which is uh, early Christianity had wandering teachers. They were traveling about. Paul's dealing with them. Other writings like the Didache is dealing with them. Mm -hmm. And so this is really saying like, if you think that you're qualified to be a teacher, be on the lookout. Mm -hmm. But to what de yeah. degree can we hear 3-1 and say, to yeah. any of you who have the ability to influence other people with words yeah. in the social media age, that's everyone. Yeah. Be aware. Be aware that what you do with your words will be will be judged the ways in which you influence people will be judged and i think that that applies to everything from you know spreading conspiracy theories on social media um or you know false quotations i found a there was a, a c.s lewis quotation that was going around facebook earlier this week that was completely false it's obvious it's so easy to tell that it's false but you know being spread by a good-hearted christian um but so, you know, at some level, this, I think this calls all of us into account to say, yeah. if you have the ability to influence people with your words, you really need to be careful. That's exactly right. Oh, it's exactly right, Chris. And even if for James's day, it might have been, might have been more specifically focused, I think for us, it is exactly right. It's about all of us, anybody yeah. who uses words. Yeah. yeah. So, so when we get into this language of the tongue, um, we, we, uh, we see that James is using several metaphors. And as you point out in your commentary and as other interpreters point out, these are metaphors that are, that are sort of in the water in the mm -hmm. ancient Greco-Roman philosophical world. Um, so we have this idea of horses and their bit. We have this idea of a, of a ship, a giant ship with a very small rudder, um, mm -hmm. a, a spark and a huge wildfire or even wild, wild animals. Um, but w w ultimately, what do you, how do you make sense of these analogies, you know, either in their particulars or in the sort of overall message about what James is trying to tell us about mm -hmm. the tongue, uh, about, about human speech? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the first two, well, the first three really of those are all playing on the same idea that uh, tiny things can have big consequences, right? right? So uh, the first of those, the small bit in the mouth of the horse, um, my daughter, uh, my older daughter was a horse rider for years and years and years. And so I, I can attest to this, right? That, that you, you know, just a small motion of, of the reins pulling on the horse can uh, make a dramatic effect in what the horse does. So, so that's that analogy. The rudder is similar analogy, right? So it's the seafaring metaphor. Um, the spark starting the wildfire, fire, wildfire is, uh, again, it's, it's playing on that same idea that um, small things can make a big difference. Uh, the wild animal, um, it, that's going in a slightly different direction. Right. But, but the other um, thing to notice here, um, at least from what I understand in my reading, is that um, while all of these metaphors are, as you say, in the water, uh, they're used by Plato and um, Plutarch and Aristotle and, and, you know, several classical writers. Um, when, when James turns in, what is this, verse five to the fire metaphor, um, 
he is he is becoming more um, pessimistic than right. other classical writers about speech specifically. So so here we see James um, doing something a little different with the metaphor. So it's up to that point he's saying just descriptively, look how a small thing, a tongue, a rudder, a bit can do, uh, can have a large effect. Now he's taking with the fire metaphor, he is taking a specifically negative, uh, he's, he's observing something that's destructive, yeah. not, not something that's just neutral. Yeah. Um, he is talking about Gehenna, right, eventually there, uh, that, that, uh, that it stains the whole body, it sets on fire the cycle of nature and is itself set on fire by hell, by Gehenna. Yikes. Right? Uh, Yikes. That's, not, that's, not new, that's not neutral. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. And incidentally, I mean, again, I think this is so interesting. Uh, I think it was Luke Timothy Johnson who says that, that, that the use of Gehenna there gives us one clue, one of the clues that lead him and other scholars to think that this might be... Um, Early. Uh, written in Palestine, in Palestine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Anyway, that's it. Interesting. Because just briefly, Gehenna in its sort of like early first century, wor you know, world is not is not hell. It's not Dante's Inferno with the demons. It. it I mean, it is a garbage pit outside of the city where where there there was fire. And of course, mm -hmm. in the apocalyptic worldview and in some other texts, that was associated with the ultimate place of God's judgment, but it's, you know, we often do this translation when we hear Gehenna, we think, oh, surely this is Dante's Inferno. Um, yeah. And it's, it's a little different. Um, right, than it's that. a specific, it's a specific geographical location. Yeah, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. right. But at any rate, he's, he's clearly playing on the, the destructiveness uh, and, and the uncontrollable destructiveness yeah. of, um, of speech, yeah. which just seems so timely today. So yeah. Clear. So yeah, as an Old Testament ancient Near East person, gonna, yeah, I was um, going to get you in here, Brendan. Yeah, Come on, I, I, I love, I love this kind of focus on on speech because we oftentimes, you know, like sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. People say, I mean, that's obviously not true. Okay. Um, words have hurt me more than I, I mean, I've broken bones, and I, I, I promise that there are words that have hurt me worse than the broken bones. Mm -hmm. um, so all to say, like you know, the, the 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 power of words is such an ancient Near Eastern thing too. You know, the idea that blessings do something or that curses mm -hmm. have some sort of actual function they actually do something in the world um, that speech can make someone come alive or even make someone die inside um, but uh, I, and I, one thing I love about James is the way he's drawing from very specific traditions of uh, the Hebrew Bible I mean so like the the being made in the likeness of God which is not found all over the Old Testament but you know it's kind of drawing specifically from Genesis 1 which is really neat mm. um, and you know just a cool T twist in the, in the argument and in the theology there. Um, but also he's drawing from these very uh, uh, deep and broad traditions of ancient or Eastern wisdom. So, I mean, I just pulled this up kind of randomly, but this is a, a Babylonian text, the, the Councils of Wisdom from 1500 BC. And it, it says, let your mouth be controlled and your speech guarded. Therein is a person's wealth. Let your lips be very precious. So the idea that you're, you know, you're every, everything you say is, has the ability to like, produce money for you or make it go away, right? Um, let ins insolence and blasphemy be your abomination. Speak nothing profane, nor any untrue report. A tale bearer is accursed. You know, just that idea that like, you know, you it brings some kind of actual judgment. Um, the part of that ancient Near Eastern wisdom idea that like the world is actually, you know, the God in Israel or the gods in the ancient Near East have created the world with patterns in it. Um, and if you pay attention to those patterns, uh, you can mm. kind of manipulate how your life turns out. Um, so I, I mean, I love seeing James's like looking at nature, these things in nature uh, coming from Greco-Roman sources, but also that kind of broad idea of the power of speech also coming from his ancient Near Eastern uh, theology. I mean, I, I look at um, yeah. Proverbs 15, which starts, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise dispenses knowledge, and the mouths of fools pour out folly. And then verse four, I love this one. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but 
uh, perverseness in it breaks the spirit, uh, the nefesh, like it breaks yourself, your, your, your whole, mm. your whole being. Um, but the idea that like, uh, this, the, you know, good, good speech is uh, a tree of life. Um, and so connecting it to the very idea of wisdom herself, um, which we oh, would yeah. say in the Israelite tradition that she is a living being, um, that actually is kind of the, the, the principle, you know, of, of everything making sense in the world that God, uh, created yeah. the world even through. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, what, what, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, go, go, go. No, well, okay. one last stop on the way is that uh, people have noticed that like Proverbs and Job, we mentioned this when we talked about Job, mm -hmm. is uh, very separate from the idea of Torah. Um, there's not a whole lot of conversation about like Moses. Moses doesn't show up in Job. Moses doesn't show up in Proverbs. Um, you know, Moses' laws, the, the particularity mm -hmm. of the commandments to Israel don't show up in those texts, but in Sirach or Ben Sira or Ecclesiasticus, mm -hmm. all three names refer to the exact same book. A book written about 175 or so BC in Jerusalem um, by a uh, wise person, or maybe it's a collection of wise sayings under the name of this person, uh, uh, Ben Sira. Uh, but the, he talks about uh, how wisdom herself, this personified wisdom, you could read about in Proverbs 8, she created the universe uh, with God's help, um, but uh, uh, that, that this becomes the law. Um, and so in uh, uh, Sirach 24, verse 23, all this is he's talking about wisdom herself. Wisdom is doing the same things she does in Proverbs. She's setting tables and inviting people in and teaching them things. And then uh, Ben Sirach says, all this is the book of the covenant of the most high God, the law that Moses commanded us and so on. It overflows with wisdom like the Pishon, like the Tigris and the Euphrates, and it gives first fruit. So it's a tree, it's woman wisdom, it's a river overflowing, um, but also it's the, it's the law itself, which is you know kind of understood here to be both what Moses received, but also kind of the teaching, the God's wisdom is, is mm -hmm. like in, in there. So it's the, it's the confluence or the bringing together these ancient traditions. And I can see that in James, you know, this idea that the Torah oh, is there and you know, the center of the Torah, but also it's this instruction, it's this ancient wisdom. It's kind of this beautiful, J James three is this beautiful interweaving of all of those the really deft interweaving of all of those traditions together that I, uh, you know, anyway, but the idea that it comes together with speech, I just love to, cause it's a favorite of the, uh, of the ancient folks. But, sorry, I went on yeah, there for a little I while. But, yeah, what were you going to say, Martha? I'm sorry, I interrupted. Oh, I, I, I was just going to, just to, just to affirm um, and celebrate what you're saying that, that one of the things that has seemed true to me um, is that for James, as for Ben Sira, the, the, um, there is, the, there is a lot of fluidity between the category of wisdom and mm. word and law. Yeah, the mm. way that James, not in this passage, but elsewhere when he talks about the law, it seems to be interchangeable with what he means by the word of God, which he talks mm. about in chapter one, which I know you all talked about a couple of yeah. weeks ago, right? The word of God is what gives us life. It becomes implanted in us. It bears fruit. And then yeah. you've got the whole image of the fruit bearing tree, which connects us to lady, well, wisdom again. Yeah, yeah, woman wisdom, yeah, yeah. Here, Woman and wisdom, but, but here too in, in mm -hmm. chapter three, you've got, uh, you've got the theme of the words which can tear down, but can also bring life, mm -hmm. right? Can also bear fruit. Um, and that's the category of word, but it's also interwoven with the category of wisdom. So yeah, that, that th those things are, are all interwoven. Um, and, and how God creates just, by word in Genesis one, and you know, right. here the power right. to create by word, but also the power to destroy too. Yeah, yeah. Deeply, deeply, and and you hear echoes uh, also of Psalm one along the way, mm. right? Of the yeah. trees planted by streams of living water bearing fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the same thing as the. Well, maybe it is. Uh, you know, yeah, tree of yeah. Life. It's it, it's all there. It's all. Yeah. But the other thing I was going to say, uh, Brennan, you mentioned just in passing, and I didn't want to let this go. Uh, this image of, uh, in verse nine, um, mm -hmm. that says, uh, with the tongue, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. Uh, mm -hmm. The NRSV has likeness. You could also translate it as image. But, mm -hmm. but, that, but this is actually the only yeah. time in the New Testament, the only time in the New Testament that that term is used wow. to describe humanity as a whole. Yeah, wow. That's right. amazing. Chris, I mean, yeah, that's no, that you, uh, that's something I learned from your commentary where yeah. we yeah. frequently, not frequently, but in places we hear of Christ, for example, in the, the, Christ, the Colossians yeah. hymn that, that yeah. Christ is the image of the invisible God, right. um, similar right. language in the gospel of John, but it's clearly a special relationship that, right. that God and Jesus have. And here, this is, as Brennan said, it's, it's calling on the, the Genesis creation narrative in a way that none of our other New Testament texts pick up on. Yeah. Right. It's amazing. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so here, yeah. here too, we get this, this, uh, well, this Jewish 
Christian uh, kind of teacher, wisdom teacher that, uh, that gives us something that has become really important in Christian theological anthropology, but we don't, we don't realize how rare it is right. that the New Testament talks that way. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I want to, I just want to go ahead. Just real quick before we, before we jump away, just one last thing about this, that I, you know, the, the, the traditions of woman wisdom uh, are something that fascinate me, but also my uh, esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Yoder uh, and Professor Brown, Bill Brown and Christine Yoder, uh, who both are interested in wisdom and woman wisdom and, you know, kind of tracing these things. Um, but fascinating to me is uh, the way that in Jewish tradition, Ben Sira's movement to take woman wisdom and think of her as the Torah itself leads to this idea that you know that you use a thing called the tree of life to read from the torah the torah is in an arc uh it kind of is the center of uh, a jewish synagogue tradition and worship um uh that the, there is this kind of uh personification of god's wisdom inside the torah um but then in christian tradition through john one and also through colossians one and so on you get this idea that jesus is the word or the image or the likeness or mm. in some way the represent you know um and it seems it's so neat to me how james is kind of threading the needle there or, or kind of going between like tying all these things together and uh, uh showing us perhaps this uh, amazing insight into a time when the, the paths had not parted yet um and uh exactly. they were all kind of uh those you know kind of a, a a rich gumbo of religious traditions um, that later on got separated <laughs> out but i love that yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 exactly. I think the only the only other thing I want to say about the the these these descriptions of the tongue. Um, mm. I remember memorizing this verse in junior high because, or in high school, because it was it was so fun that the tongue is a what does it say? The tongue is a restless evil, full of death dealing poison, and we did like 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 a snake for poison. But <laughs> but I. Again, I, I think that this is one of those places that can easily come off of our back because we think like curse, like, oh, that's just to say a bad thing about another person. But at some level, this is engaging, you know, the the understanding in religion and in magic that, that words actually did mean something. And to, to call down a curse on someone, uh, to inflict them with a poison um, is really, really suggests the powerful nature of our words that we we could actually, you know, put a spell on someone with our words. This was, you know, we, we think about it as, you know, an, a time past, but we, this is really, at least in my mind, this is really in the water when we talk about blessing and cursing, that it is um, the ability, and I loved how you guys have both talked about it, does our speech lead to life for other people, or does it take away life from other people? Mm -hmm. That seems to be sort of, a yeah. fundamental uh, question that this text asks for us, and we see it in the brackish water, in the in the pure water, life-giving water, water that could never produce life. Um, you know, fruit trees and 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 non-fruit bearing trees and, and and that that sort of thing. So, I wonder, um, Martha, just as we sort of transition to the next section of chapter three, if if you could talk a little bit about sort of how you see this part of James three. Um, relating to us today, we've already sort of gestured towards some of this, but mm. what is the significance of James 3, 1 uh, through 12 for mm. people living in our context today mm -hmm. um, in this world? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you've, you've named it. I think it just, it, it calls us to pay really close attention to what we say to and about other people particularly i mean james is concerned particularly about interpersonal relations right here um and the way that cursing does real damage and he's calling attention to to uh the um it's not even irony it's just the the contradiction the contradiction in thinking that we can um bless god and curse our neighbor you know, to, to think that that's even a legitimate thing to do. It, it leaves us, I think, in a really, um, me, leaves me in a, in a, um, in a space of judgment, uh, uh, my, you know, on myself, uh, to recognize the way in which I sing hymns and I, and I, right, pray, and I also, you know, use my words to do real harm, sometimes intentionally, frequently, not intentionally, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. right? It's, it's the harm. It's the harm that, that, that matters. Yeah. 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 In the and political season, we're in. Yeah. 
Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say the, poli- the political season we're in, it seems like, uh, you know, we're rediscovering this kind of um, innate power of words and images that kind of take on a life of their own memes, political memes, uh, even just like little things like, uh, you know, is Kamala Harris uh, able to be elected because maybe she's a foreigner, you know, and the whole, it's all, it's a cynical game the idea, you know, that we're just going to put something in the water to just make people kind of suspicious or, you know, the, or the pandemic, you know, uh, uh, you know, stuff. Um, but this idea that people are weaponizing words in ways that have been used in the past, but are um, being amplified, I think, by technology and the reach that Chris mentioned and, and Martha used well, social media and things like this, you know, we, we've, it's like we've, uh, uh, you know, if, if we're following James here, that like we're, you know, a tongue is like a, a, a potential for fire, which can give you heat and light and warm you and cook your food, or it can burn you uh, and hurt other people, right? Um, you know, but uh, we, we've, it's like we got blow torches now or grenade launchers, everyone is walking around with them, you know? Um, uh, but I, I just, I, I, I read this and I thought, you know, uh, I think there's something a lot of people need to hear because we're in such an era of extreme polarization and demonization. Um, no matter which side you're on, that, that seems to be kind of the way that people think the game needs to be played uh, or like that's the way we need to carry out our lives. But if we start from the, from the idea that everyone, even your, your political enemy, um, is made in the image of the sovereign God of the universe, yeah. then how would that change the way that we relate to them, you know, or think about what yeah. it means to achieve our goals or I don't know. Yeah, it just, oh, <laughs> this, yeah. everything's ha- happening now is giving me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not comfortable. I mean, James doesn't is not trying to make us comfortable. Uh, yeah. I think for sure. Well, and, and I, I think it's right to say that this didn't this didn't start with the 2020 election or the 2016 election. It it, it is it you know we 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 can't put blame on one political party or the other. Right. But the degree to which we have become very comfortable, and I think this is especially true in social media, um, we've become very comfortable with the dehumanizing language, you know, as soon as you describe another group as, as thugs, um, yeah. or as, as, you know, idiots, or, you know, again, this is a place where, where, where James echoes Jesus's speech about, you know, n- not murder, murder is not the issue. Fine, you, you, you don't murder people, but you're doing the same thing when you call somebody else a fool. Um, yeah. that is the violence of our speech. And again, this is, this is a place where reading James in the 21st century, I am so convicted with how easy, how natural it is for me to just say, oh, my opponents are, you know, subhuman, essentially. Um, and I would say it in much more eloquent, beautiful language, uh, because I'd be, you know, stealing something from Brennan. Um, but, but, <laughs> but essentially that's what it is. Um, and, and so I just, yeah, I just, this is a place in James where I, I co- find myself coming back to again and again as a point of clear challenge. I agree. I agree. Yeah. It never gets old. All right. So let's move on, uh, Brennan and, and Martha, to the, the second half. Uh, well, it's not even half. It's six or so verses in James 3. Um, and it picks up um, this language about wisdom. Um, and so I'm wondering, yeah, again, since we've already recognized, Martha, that you are the only expert in this room tonight, um, if you would sort of trace us through this argument, like what's the basic contours of, of this, these two forms of wisdom that James is talking about? Um, and, you know, where do you see the sort of the major points that James is making? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so at verse 13, um, he's, in a, in a way, it's a continuation of what he's already been, already been talking about, right? He's already been talking about use of speech. Here, though, he, he opens with the question, who is wise and understanding among you? So he might be thinking again about those self-identified teachers, um, certainly wisdom, those people who think that they might have wisdom or understanding to impart. Uh, but he quickly moves to say, in, in response to his own question, uh, show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. So again, we're back to chapter two, the same theme, right? That it's the works that are going to show right. whether or not you're really wise. Right. Um, it's, not, it's not what you say, or it's not the faith that you profess to have, which is what he was talking about in chapter two. Uh, um, so he's, he's setting up this contrast between people who might say that they believe or say that they have wisdom and those who actually live it. Um, but then he, um, he contrasts, as you said, uh, these two different forms of wisdom. One that is worldly wisdom, and here we have to be careful about 
what he does and does not mean by the language of world, but yeah. for his purposes, he associates worldly wisdom with envy, with selfish ambition, with chaos, with violence. Um, yeah. And he describes it as, this is in chapter, excuse me, verse uh, 15, earthly, unspiritual, devilish, um, and where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will be disorder and wickedness of every kind. Okay, so that's all the, that's the bad stuff, right? That's the bad right. wisdom, that's the kind of work what he associates with the world. And then the contrast is the wisdom that genuinely comes from God. And he uh, describes this as, uh, this is from verse 17, first pure and then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits. There's that language of fruits again, uh, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. Um, and so, so he's setting up a contrast and he's gonna continue that then in the next uh, section in ch chapter four, a really sharp kind of dualism between friendship with the world and friendship with God. And he's gonna claim that you can't be both. Yeah. Uh, so here he's already developing that kind of dualism. Uh, but what does he mean by the world? It, it's, it's the same kind of chaotic, destructive energy that we've seen uh, in what, what destructive words do. Right. Um, uh, but it's also, um, it's language that he has used back in chapter one, even to talk about those who are double-minded, right. uh, back, uh, where is it? Chapter one, verse, uh, eight, the doubter being double-minded and unstable in every way, this kind of double-mindedness he's already named at the beginning of chapter one seems to be coming back here. He's claiming that you can't actually, um, again, you can't bless God and curse your neighbor. You can't have wisdom of the world and wisdom from God. You've got to make a choice. It's sort of yeah. like the two ways, Brennan, right? You get in the, yeah. in the, um, in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, that notion that you've got, you've got a choice to make here. You can't, you can't go both. You can't do both things. Um, yeah. You've got to, if you're going to follow God, if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to genuinely be walking in the ways of wisdom, then this is what it's going to look like. Um, yeah. And there's like always this kind of critique of the, like, Proverbs or Psalm one, there's two ways, right? It's like, those oh, too simplistic. Ethics is more complicated than that. And I totally sure. agree. Ethics is more complicated sure. than that. But the rhetorical uh, approach here from ancient, I mean, ancient people were just as smart as we are. They, they understood that there was actually a lot of gray area and ethics and so on. But, um, but they're trying to draw this, yes, yeah, very strict dichotomy because there are lots of times that we use that idea that it's like, it's not so simple if you were in my shoes, right? to justify and uh, all sorts of bad things uh, and really to explain away our, our own guilt. Mm -hmm. um, I think James, you know, and he's like, he's uh, using that kind of rhetorical device of saying, no, there's a good and a bad way here. And yeah. <laughs> uh, you're either doing the good or you're doing the bad. Uh, you can't be doing the bad and the good at the same time. So in any event, yeah, I mean, I think that's, the, that, that uh, is really important. I think, I mean, that, that's challenging to me too. Um, just the idea that like, I try to think, oh, I got some little bit of worldly wisdom over here and I'm doing the smart thing with like, you know, whatever, my career, my money, my, you know, uh, whatever, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm like playing the, playing the game smartly and I love Jesus. Um, and oh, yeah. it seems like yeah. those, you're, you're being told that those are actually at odds with one another, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out how to have the best life. Um, right. that, that would be kind of for yourself or something. And I love how that ties back to what, what he says, religion that is pure, right? At the yes, very end of in, chapter in one, chapter verse 27. One, yeah. Yeah. Religion that's pure and undefiled is this care for the orphans and the widows in their distress and keep yourself unstained by the world, which to me, yeah. I think that mean that, 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 that ties here very clearly, uh -huh. you know, uh, um, that, that this, uh, this kind of earthly, unspiritual, devilish, disgusting yeah. kind of wisdom, uh, yeah. that's going to make you double-minded or something. Yeah. And I think we have to be careful here. Just, just that, that some of that language, even that language of purity, uh, we do want to be careful here, not yeah. to associate that with some kind of um, uh, simplistic uh, anti-body morality, right? Mm -hmm. That implies, mm -hmm. uh, he's not talking about that we have to just simply deny the body. We have right. to get away from this material world. That's not what he's talking about, right? Uh, right? He, he values bodies. He values caring for people and their physical mm -hmm. needs, clearly. Uh, but what he's talking about is he talks repeatedly. It's envy. It's selfish ambition. It's that that's like at the core of what he's concerned about. And it, I think it gets to this notion of um, seeing the world as a place of competition with each other, a kind yeah. of zero sum game that if some if you have gotten something, then that means there's less for me. Uh, that seems to be what he's really concerned about here. Um, so that the worldly wisdom is the wisdom of 
Brueggemann calls this, right? The, the kind of logic of scarcity versus the logic of abundance, just to go back to that old yeah. um, contrast. But I think that's relevant here, yeah. that, that James sees uh, if you have a scarcity mindset, then you're gonna be always squabbling over scraps. You're gonna go in with the assumption that there's not enough for everybody. And James wants to say, that's, that's not God's logic. Mm-hmm. That's not the wisdom that we have from God. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it ties so, to the economic logic of chapters two and, and five as well, right? Yeah. That's, that's kind of where that comes from. It's not just a purely economic critique or something, but it's like tied to this idea that uh, if you think of the world as a zero sum game, you can actually make out a lot of money in the short run. Um, you know, that other problem of wisdom literature where there's people who actually like, do the bad thing and they win. Dude. Like, how's that, how's that work? Right. You know, that's the Job's problem, right? Uh, I did everything right and it didn't work out for me. Um, but, the, but that idea that like the kind of the long arc of history or, you know, in the long run uh, that eventually those people will find out that that way of life is uh, um, empty and shallow, perhaps even, uh, uh, you know, perhaps not when we want them to, <laughs> but th- th- there's this kind of, uh, you know, long arc to that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's, uh, thanks, yeah. Mm-hmm. I love I, I love that uh, James and it's a surprising thing for me that James defines wisdom by behaviors right that yeah. wisdom is going to be shown because I again I think the traditional we associate mm-hmm. wisdom with with our big giant heads um, mm-hmm. uh, and James is saying no wisdom is you yeah. you show that you have wisdom by living rightly and so that that when uh, the wisdom of the world, the way that it manifests itself as being worldly is that it it is disorder, it's envious, it works towards chaos and 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 violence, we might even say. Whereas the wisdom that is from God, this 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 wisdom that originates with God, again, not in a material dualism, but more of an ethical or moral dualism, um, mm-hmm. shows itself in things like you know uh, peace and peaceableness and and gentleness. And in your in your commentary, I, I really liked what you said about um, being peacemakers, and mm-hmm. that wisdom from above is peaceable because you sort of walk this fine line of that doesn't mean that you sort of bend to the wills of the world or that, or that those who stand up for justice would, you know, be considered, well, they're just causing a problem. These protesters are just causing a problem. Um, You walk this really fine line about, about purity and, and, and justice and peacemaking. And just briefly, if you could just sort of tell a little bit what you, what you shared in your commentary about being peacemakers um, or, or wisdom that is peaceable. Yeah, thank you. Um, and here I have to give the credit to Margaret Amer, our colleague who teaches at Austin um, Presbyterian Seminary, um, who has written uh, also uh, extensively on James. And she, one of her books um, is on Frederick Douglass's use of James, and particularly this verse, um, this verse 317, the wisdom from above is first pure and then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. Um, Frederick Douglass, according to Margaret Amer, uh, quoted that line, um, how many times, I I don't remember the exact number, but many, many, many times in his anti-slavery speeches. And what Douglass was doing was to point out that the word order matters, that it is first pure and then peaceable. And for Douglass and for Amer, purity is not about some kind of... um, purity like we might think of it in today in terms of yeah, ascetic purity or something like, ascetic a, purity. like a purity ring like a purity ring thank you yeah, yeah. it's not about that it's it's it was about justice and righteousness um douglas so for douglas this verse is saying there is no peace until you have um righteousness which in his, in that case he's talking about uh, the abolition of slavery right so yeah. purity is about the abolition of slavery which then makes peace possible um, and I just found that so, that was so helpful to me. Yeah, um, yeah. My own reading of that. Because it'd be too easy, right, to say, it's peace, peace, right? Right, it's just be peaceful. Like, don't make any conflict. That's not, that's not what James is saying. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not all conflict is bad, uh, but, um, but conflict driven by envy and self- selfish ambition, that's, that is bad. Right, right. Yeah. So, so the peacemaking is, is at a different level than, 
uh, maybe the, if those are the Enneagram followers out there, then the nine on the Enneagram, the, the person who, who lives for harmony and, and yeah. getting everybody on the same page, that, that it might, might be something different in the book of James here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, as our colleague, uh, Raj Nadella, who will also be in the show uh, uh, two weeks from now, is that it, Chris? Two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. So uh, join us on Office Hours. Um, so Raj Nadella, uh, he, he has, as he would point out, peace can mean a lot of different things in the first century. Um, so the peace of Rome, right, which uh, uh, is a technical peace, right? There's a cessation of hostility. Uh, people aren't attacking each other with armies anymore because Rome has steamrolled them all and then now keeps them in a subjugated position and you know, has enforced a, p- a kind of peace, right? Um, which just means you, you, you accept what you get. But this is a kind of shalom peace, right? This kind of a, a bigger idea of a peace that is about the fulfillment of the universe and uh, the, the people who live in it and uh, fruition and abundance and a life-giving sense of peace. Um, and I just, I, I can't believe that, that verse 18 is not more popular um, at, like on whatever, crochet right? things or you know whatever you know and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace i just i mean i feel like i've never heard that quoted before but i love it Mm. Mm. yeah 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 Beautiful. so so we're 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 making our way towards the end of time we got a few more minutes left and and Mm -hmm. sort of before we conclude um brennan and martha and i i'll share last but what's the what's the one takeaway from james three uh for, for you two as you, as you, as we wrap up our study. Yeah, I keep coming back to something that we've already talked about, which uh, over and over, but it really is true. I think that the way that three, especially one through 12, just indicts me, you know, because it is very easy for me to read, uh, the tongue is a fire, the tongue is placed among our members. So one sets on fire, the cycle of nature, um, is itself set on fire by hell. And I can think of so many people who do that, right? All those people right. who use their words to set things on fire, how dare they? And then I think, right, yeah. James has got me, right? It, 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 it always comes back to uh, what, how am I using my words? Right. He, right. he catches me in that place of indictment. Yeah, that's a good word. Yeah. I don't know anything about that experience that you just shared. I'm sure you don't. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, why would we? What would we know about it? Um, but uh, uh, yeah, and for me, I mean, just the the uh, thorough connections um, to the Old Testament, but it, and and to Greek thought and uh, ancient or Eastern thought. But the the specific way James ties them together with that idea of a purity and a peace, which go back to that idea of kind of what is to me the core of the Torah, which is uh, God picked you because God wants you to protect those who are vulnerable. Like that's the whole, the, the, the universe is built um, for the idea of life. Uh, and uh, we, that's the task that we've been given on earth. Um, thinking about Genesis one, which James quotes here. Um, but so if we kind of start from that, that foundational principle that whoever we come into contact with is the likeness and image of God. Um, and whoever we come into contact with is probably in some way a vulnerable person some more vulnerable than others, structurally, individually, in, in certain communities, uh, certain spaces, and so on, our vulnerability shifts. But that whoever we come up against um, is in some way vulnerable and the image of God. Uh, and you know that, that might be one way, if, if we keep that in, on a loop in our head, that might be one way um, uh, to try to get a, a handle on this um, difficult bridle we have uh, that, that I certainly have my problems with too. Yeah. That's well, what about you, Chris? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I really resonate with you, Martha, about the power of the tongue. Uh, but for the sake of originality, I'll go with uh, that last verse, Brennan, that you called attention to. Um, uh, you know, the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. And, it, it, you know, again, it reminds me of Jesus' words, blessed are the peacemakers. And um, we've talked several times in our study of James, but in, in, in our other studies as well about the divisiveness and the division. Um, that are real, real realities, um, not only in the political sphere, but even within our churches and, and in our, you know, academic communities and everywhere. Um, and what does it mean to be a peacemaker um, in, a, in, in the same, in the sense, uh, Martha, that you suggest in your commentary, that it's not just, um, you know, going with the flow, it, that it's not independent of calls for justice. It's not independent, uh, independent of, of, you know, maybe stirring things up, but ultimately, 
um, living into, making way for peace. Um, and just how much of our, the American dream is all about busyness and, and grabbing and getting more and acquiring, which seems like such a non-peaceful existence. Um, uh, if even just to take that one understanding of peace as sort of, you know, a break from activity. Um, so I'm challenged to be, to think about what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Um, what does it mean to work for shalom, for, uh, for, you, you know, just a general sense of, of wholeness and well-being? So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm feeling you on that. Okay, well, um, Brennan, Martha, we are at 8 o'clock. This is the earliest that we've reached a conclusion on our study of Jane. Um, oh. But, Thank goodness. but um, yeah, we're, we're getting better. It's because because we had an actual ex. No, we have always had experts. Right. We had somebody who published on James who could really help us, <laughs> you know, on the path. Tailor the conversation. Um, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. So, so next week uh, we will continue our study with James chapter four, and uh, we will be joined by uh, the Dr. Angela Parker, who is an assistant professor of New Testament at McAfee School of Theology, which is associated with Mercer University, just up the road from you guys, um, kind of uh, you know in the you know at the two eighty five eighty five mix, and um, a place that I know really well. I taught there for two years, and so I know some of the faculty and students who have come through there. So um, this will be my first time uh, meeting, you know, Angela as much as we can meet on Zoom, but I'm excited. I've heard great things about her as a scholar and a teacher. And so we are, we're thrilled uh, to have uh, her on with us. So um, please come back uh, next week at seven o'clock uh, Eastern time for office hours on uh, James chapter four. Uh, also, one, one last thing, uh, just for anyone who happens to be watching or watches later, um, you know, we're, 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 we're thinking about the time and place of office hours. It's on Wednesday nights now. Maybe it should go back to Sunday mornings. Maybe it should say Wednesday. Also, what do we want to do next? What kind of book uh, should we, uh, or, or what kind of topic or whatever should we study next? Uh, let us know what you think, and uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing about that. Uh, Martha, thank you so much for your precious time and your uh, wisdom, uh, which you are always willing to share, and I'm so grateful for it. Thank you so much, and uh, bye, everybody. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye.